you. So first of all, thank you all for coming today. And thanks for having me again uh, at Google. It's always very nice to be here. Um, so I've written a few books now. And this latest one, the Nordic Baking Book, it actually marks the end uh, to a six-year research process that produced the Nordic Cookbook after three years and now finishes with uh, this publication. And it's, um, the whole purpose of these books were to be documentary and to tell people about Nordic food culture in a true way. Because I think that Nordic food culture is one of the most misunderstood food cultures on the planet. I mean, uh, largely because of people like myself, actually. Because if you, um, if you search on the internet for uh, Nordic food culture, Nordic cooking, things like that, uh, the first thing you get up is like a, a thousand articles about Faviken and Noma and a handful of other very ambitious contemporary restaurants. And none of them really uh, are very indicative of how people actually eat in the Nordics. <laughs> Um, and then inside of that, you also get uh, a whole bunch of recipes for uh, gravlax, for herring, and for meatballs and cinnamon buns. <laughs> and those are Nordic dishes, but that's not really what people eat on an everyday basis either. Uh, and then the last thing you get is like a lot of people photographing their meatball meal at IKEA. <laughs> so I felt that uh, there was a real need for these books. And it's been an enormous privilege to uh, get to spend this long, uh, supported by a publisher, researching, researching my own food culture, a food culture that I thought I knew a lot about, and that it turned out that I knew a lot less than I thought about. <laughs> um, and uh, it's a little bit strange now to see these both books out, um, the project being done. But it's also amazing to see people interact with both of the books, uh, tagging me in photos on social media of buns they've made, people coming to these lectures, and uh, really learning about a food culture that I think they knew very little about before. And one thing that I learned, especially during the second half of this project, is how great the diversity and the depth is of Nordic baking culture. And I have come to believe very firmly that Nordic baking culture is actually the greatest baking uh, culture on the planet today in terms of diversity and depth. And that might sound a little bit less than obvious for most people. Uh, and uh, my plan now is that I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about sort of making my case for Nordic baking culture. And then uh, I'll open up for some question uh, towards, towards the end. Do we have a problem? <laughs> Sorry, Justin. No, it's OK. Go, go ahead, continue. I got this. <laughs> Justin. <laughs> um, so the, the best place to start when we talk about culture, it's the people. Because without people, we can't have any culture, baking or otherwise. And the Nordic region, it's inhabited by about 26 million people. And they're spread out over a surface area just under 3.5 million square kilometers. And that can't, by any stretch, be called particularly densely populated. I mean, uh, we can compare this to, for example, the whole rest of Europe without the Nordics, which would then you know, have about 90 people per square kilometer. It's even more interesting if you start comparing to specific countries. Uh, let's say France, for example. France has 116 people per square kilometer. Germany, uh, the most populous country in Europe, has 237 people per square kilometer. And as a little example to compare the two, if you were to take all of the Germans and just spread them out in an even layer across their whole country, you would end up having a German every 75th meter in every direction, one even layer. If you were to do the same in the Nordic region, there would be 375 meters between each person. And that's a huge difference. So we have this vast geographical area with a very, very scarce population. And I mean, if we were to go back in time, let's say a few hundred years, to, uh, to an era when a lot of what we consider our cultural identity of today was actually founded, what would this scarcity of population actually have meant for the way that knowledge was transmitted between people? Can anyone give me some examples, perhaps? What do you think? <laughs> 
what would this mean? Think before, like social media, television, cell phones, all of this stuff. Not a lot of town favorite recipes. <laughs> Anyone else? A lot of word of mouth. A lot of word of mouth. I mean, the, 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 I think that the, um, the most important sort of general observation about the difference between now and then would be that uh, information, knowledge everywhere would have been transmitted at a much lower pace back then than it is now. And as you say, word of mouth, you essentially had to talk face to face to a person to acquire the information that they might have. Uh, or you had to write a letter. And I think that, I mean, we can all agree that writing a physical letter, although it's a beautiful thing, uh, is not a particularly efficient way of sharing lots of information quickly. Or, I mean, the third option, if you wanted to learn from a trusted source, you could also read a book. And back then, I mean, 300 years ago, there were like three books. I mean, one was the Bible. And, and then there were two more that didn't deal with baking either. So, uh, I mean, uh, none of these things would have actually uh, um, really done much for the culture of baking. So if we were to agree then that information flowed slower everywhere because of the lack of technology, I think we can also imagine that in an area as scarcely populated as the Nordic region, this effect would have been further exaggerated, simply because there is just much more distance between each person that you can interact with face to face. And this is very important for my reasoning, and it's something that I will come back to a little bit later. Um, and now I'm going to make an example as well, sort of to illustrate this. And so I have uh, my good friend Joan here tonight. He sits there uh, in the back. He happened to be in San Francisco today, so he just came here to have a little look as well. And let's say that Joan tomorrow would invent a new cake recipe. And it's not just any cake recipe. It's actually the most delicious cake recipe ever invented by humankind. <laughs> it's completely revolutionary. Um, and he would bake this cake recipe. Maybe he would share it uh, with his family, you know, and he would do what most people do today when they do something they're proud of, some, some kind of achievement. He would share it on social media. And because of this cake and its extreme deliciousness, I mean, everyone who uh, sees it on social media, they're a bit excited because, I mean, he's claiming that he's made the world's best cake, right? Uh, and perhaps a few of them will ask for the recipe and they will do the same thing. They will also bake it. And little by little, sort of information generation by information generation, um, this cake recipe spreads out into the world. And then all of a sudden, maybe, uh, you know, it hits someone with a bit of, you know, a bit more reach, perhaps a couple hundred thousand followers. And it gets even further out into uh, the world of information. And all of a sudden, it's featured in Martha Stewart living. I mean, Johan's cake recipe. And then it takes one more week, and it's my birthday back home in Sweden. And Tove, my wife, who has also done a lot of the uh, recipe development for uh, these two books, she's made birthday cake. But it's not my normal birthday cake, which is the green marzipan layer cake, which is you know, the princess cake, the most delicious birthday, birthday cake there is, I think. No, no, it's another one. It's a new one. But it's not Johan's cake either. It's the vegan raw food version of Johan's cake <laughs> that Tove has gotten from her Goop newsletter. And, and that's sort of how uh, information flows today when it comes to um, food. Much, much faster. And not only does it spread quickly, more quickly over a large area, it also mutates quicker into new versions of itself. And this is a huge difference. I mean, this is, hasn't been going on for very long. And if we were to compare this with how things were uh, back a couple of hundred years ago, I mean, Johan could still have invented the cake. It would have been equally delicious as it was today. Uh, he would have made it for his family. And then, like, that would have been it, right? Uh, and then perhaps uh, when Johan's kids were to leave the house, you know, after 20 years of eating his cake, uh, perhaps they got married into the neighboring farm 800 meters away. Um, another four people would have learned about the cake. So in, in, you know, in the span of 20 years, it would have spread, you know, spread over a diameter of two kilometers and eight people would have known about the cake, the most delicious cake invented by humankind. Uh, and I mean, this is a bit of an uh, over-exaggerating, but I think, I think that you get the point. Um, and to put this simply, a scarce population spread out over a vast area used to mean 
and to some extent still means today that knowledge travels slower. And this in its turn, it will always mean that you get a more varied expression of all commonly practiced culture. This is simply because people are less influenced by each other because they you know, do less of the same stuff. And this is one reason to why the Nordic region has a more diverse baking culture than almost any other region in the world. Another reason for this diversity um, that is also somewhat related to uh, the scarcity of population and which really influences the uh, baking culture, it's the bakeries and their role in society. And in the Nordics, baking culture, it's not carried primarily by commercial bakeries, but rather by people in their homes. And this is not just something that used to be uh, accurate in the past, it's something that still applies today. And, and this is, I mean, it has to do with geography, because what does bakeries need to sustain themselves? Customers. Customers, exactly. I mean, they're going to need to have people there. And if you have 375 meters to you know, every person, that's not many. Um, and I mean, there are definitely bakeries in the Nordics. There's always been bakeries in the Nordics. But they're concentrated in quite a small geographical area. At least they used to be historically. Um, I mean, you would have found most of these bakeries that were uh, sort of common enough to uh, produce bread as a daily staple in cities. And most of the cities in the Nordics are in the southern third of Sweden, a bit on the uh, sort of southwest coast of Finland, all of Denmark, and then an area uh, you know, around Oslo and a little bit up on the west coast of Norway. That's where you would have found these cities that were big enough to sustain bakeries in the past. And I actually uh, did a little test <laughs> when I did another talk that was on a completely different subject uh, just some weeks ago. I had 100 people in the room, and I asked them all what they thought was the uh, greatest baking culture on the planet. None of them said Nordic. Uh, what do you guys think they said? France. Yeah, they said France. Or 99 of them said France, and then there was this one guy who said Austrian. Yeah. <laughs> And I mean, I started thinking about this, and, and I think that I would have said France as well before starting with this project. And I started thinking more about, I mean, what, why, did, why does everyone think this? Like, what's the substance behind uh, this immediate assumption from almost every person you meet that the French baking culture is the greatest, greatest on the planet? I think that this is simply a case and a great example of a very, very clever and successfully executed branding exercise by the French. <laughs> you know, you visit France, uh, there's uh, baguettes, you buy them, there are eclairs, you buy them, and then you have a great time in France. Um, and I mean, if we start to look at what French baking culture actually is, it's the polar opposite to what Nordic baking culture looks like. Have I done something strange? No. Nope. Oh, good. <laughs> um, as opposed to ours, uh, the French baking culture is almost entirely driven by professional bakeries. People in France, they don't bake that much at home. And I mean, why would they? Um, th there's a bakery in every tiny little village in France. And France is very evenly and quite densely populated, as we said before. So I mean, there's. Oh, absolutely no incentive to bake your own bread uh, on, a, on a regular basis so that it becomes a daily staple. And if we take this a step further and think about what this actually means for the culture of you know, eating and baking bread, um, I imagine that many in this room, perhaps almost all of you, have been to France and you've bought and eaten something from a French bakery. Perhaps you were there on vacation. I mean, perhaps you lived there for a while. I don't know. Uh, but I think that most of us can agree that French bakeries are lovely places. I mean, the baguettes, the butter croissant, pain au chocolat, apricot turnovers, flan, pain croissant. I mean, all of these things are examples of great, great pastries and bakes. And I, too, love a French bakery. I mean, I used to live there. Uh, I've been to a lot of them and not just in Paris where I lived, but all over the country. And when I started thinking about these things, one thing that I realized that they're pretty much all the same. 
they share almost exactly the same repertoire of baked goods, regardless of where in France they are. And I mean, sure, the butter rolled into a croissant in Brittany might be a little bit salter than the one outside of Nice. Perhaps the apricots are fresh in the south and they're canned in the north, and they're definitely some regional variations and some uh, uh, regional specialties that are added on to this standard repertoire across the country. But all in all, they are remarkably similar. And as I said before, in France, people rarely bake at home. And if they do, they bake uh, dessert. You know, might go to uh, the bakery, buy a roll of uh, puff pastry, and go home and make tata tan. That's sort of the extent of it. And I mean, as you can understand, this is uh, not exactly a, a great growing ground for uh, cultural, cultural individuality and uh, diversity. And I mean, this is because businesses, uh, uh, bakeries are businesses. And uh, businesses, they have to function financially. And I mean, this happens when you find that sweet spot between what people want to buy and what's actually possible to produce in a, an efficient enough manner. So there is always going to be, for all uh, cultures, cultures dominated by businesses, certain uh, circumstances and rules around them that will shape and to quite a large degree streamline what these places produce. And I think that very often with food we tend to forget this because we are so, I mean, we take food a little bit for granted and we don't really see food as part of normal business, even though it, it is, obviously. And I think you can make a um, bit of a, an interesting comparison with, for example, you know, other types of manufacturing. Let's say that you compare bakeries and car companies. So almost all car companies, except for some cosmetic differences, make essentially the same product, right? Rectangular box, wheel in each corner, it goes either like that or like that. And you know, it, they, they kind of do the same thing. Um, and the same rules apply there because they're a business, you know, uh, and they've collectively figure out the, the best way of producing something that's as close as possible to what people want to buy. And it's exactly the same for the bakeries. And also, most bakeries, they're run by bakers. And most bakers who run bakeries, they've also gone to a school somewhere where they learned how to bake. Incidentally, they learned how to bake exactly the same way as pretty much all of the others who also went to school and started bakeries. Um, and because their business model works and has worked for a long time, most likely what they're going to teach the next generation of bakers is some iteration of what they are already doing. And none of this really promotes diversity in culture. Um, so in a baking culture driven by bakeries, you will inevitably only have a fraction of the diversity found in a culture that's driven by people baking in the home. And this is another reason. Uh, why there is no more diverse, ba diverse baking culture in the world than in the Nordics. And I actually think that a comparison between the US and Sweden here really illustrates the differences in how much people actually bake at home. Because something that I've understood here in the US now when we've done all of the recipe testing with independent recipe testers in America to see that the recipes actually function, uh, and also something that I've come to uh, talk a lot about during this tour when we were meeting people and talking about the book, is that um, it's hard to buy fresh yeast here. I mean, essentially, it seems to me that if you want to buy fresh yeast in America, you have to sort of sneak up in the alley behind some bakery and like go in the back door and buy some of their yeast stash, you know? Uh, which is very different from how it would be in, for example, Sweden, where you can buy fresh yeast in every grocery store, every petrol station, every 7-Eleven, many newsstands will have fresh yeast. And that, that's not just because they have a, a pretty yellow color, the cubes, and you know, people have them for fun. It's because people buy them. Uh, and people buy them because they want to bake with them. Um, and I think that this illustrates how big a part of um, people's sort of home cooking baking makes out in the Nordic region. Uh, and then <clears throat> you have geography and climate. Another very important influence on what people eat. And as I said before, the Nordics, it's a vast region. I mean, from the southernmost bit of Denmark all the way up to the northern parts of Spitsberg and islands uh, north of Norway, from Finland in the east to Greenland all the way in the west, it's a huge region. I mean, you can fit all of the rest of Europe a whole bunch of times in there. Uh, I think you can fit the whole US in there as well, easily. And sure, I mean, a lot of this is ocean. 
but that doesn't really matter because when it comes to cultural diversity uh, dependent on the geography it's not you know the important thing is not that it's evenly populated the important thing is the distance between the extremes where people actually live and in terms of climate naturally in such a vast area you will also have a lot of variation and this in its turn it will mean that people uh, what people have been able to grow in the past and thereby bake with and integrate into our culture it's varied a lot depending on where they live and you can take wheat for example wheat is a grain that needs uh, fairly particular circumstances to grow well it needs uh, a long enough and a warm enough summer it needs quite a lot of water and it needs very fertile ground to grow well. And these circumstances you won't find everywhere in the Nordic region. You'll actually find them pretty much in that same region where all of those cities were located, funnily. You know? um, so in the southern third of Sweden, a little bit on the uh, uh, Finnish west coast, a little bit in south Norway and all over Denmark. That's where wheat was traditionally grown and it's also where most of the wheat-based recipes in traditional Nordic baking happens to come from. And funnily enough, what used to be uh, you know, practical limitations and necessities in the past, it tends to inform our choices today a lot. Uh, and then you can go on and you can look at, for example, Denmark. So Denmark has the most fertile farmland in the Nordics. It's a great agricultural production area. And they grow a lot of wheat. And wheat has always been a, an important trade commodity, very expensive. So what they used to do historically is that they grew the wheat on their best land and then they sold it off to continental Europe, almost all of it. And on all of the poorer pieces of land, instead of wheat, they grew rye. Because rye, it ripens very dependently every summer in Denmark. And they therefore have a, a really great rye bread culture. And because uh, southern Sweden is close to Denmark, you'll also find a bit of rye bread there and you'll find in both Denmark and South Sweden breads that you historically wouldn't have found anywhere else, which were breads that had both rye and wheat in them. It's unique to this area. And then you can look at Finland. So Finland has almost all rye. Almost no other grains are used in traditional Finnish baking. And this is because most of the country is located too far north, so it's too cool in the summer for uh, the wheat to grow there. And then in the, in the sort of southern part, the warmest part of Finland, um, it, it's, it's, it has inland climate towards the Russian border. So even if it would have been warm enough for the wheat to grow there and the summer would have been long enough, it's too dry. So it doesn't work. But rye, it can take a lot less water during the summer. So they have a, you know, it, and it, it, it informs all of their baking culture. Where I grew up, further north up in Sweden, uh, you can't grow wheat because it's too cool. Uh, in the summer. You can't grow rye either for the same reason. So people used to grow oats and barley. And oats, ha it has no gluten at all in it. And barley will have a little bit of gluten. And gluten you need to make fluffy breads. So the further north you come in Scandinavia, the flatter the breads will be. You know? Until you hit the point, sort of halfway up through Sweden and Norway, where I used to grow up. Um, where the traditional uh, bakes would be only flat breads, either soft or dry. And I mean, I'm going to compare this to France again, just because it's a, it's a very easy comparison to make. So what grains do we find in France? It's like wheat everywhere. They grow almost exclusively wheat. I mean, and why would they grow anything else? Uh, pretty much all of the country, except for like the warmest and driest bits towards the southeast, has a great growing climate for wheat. And wheat is in Europe and has traditionally been the most well paid for grain crop. But then you look at you know, the repertoire of recipes. Almost all of the uh, recipes for both um, breads and savory pastries in uh, France, they're based on one single grain, which is wheat. If you look all of the Nordics, I mean, we've had four different grains who've all been you know, equally important to specific parts of the region, meaning that we have four times as much base material to work with meaning more diversity. We can do the questions afterwards, sorry. <laughs> so these sort of climate and, and you know, it's, its limiting factors has historically created a lot of diversity. Uh, and 
as, we, as I said before, the Nordic region is also vast, but it's a vast region that's located almost all of it in a marginal climate. Uh, and it's marginal in a sense that for people to successfully live there, you know, you have to plan ahead a little bit. You can't just expect to harvest plant-based foods all throughout the year, which, be the, which, which would be the case in quite a large part of the Mediterranean area, um, you know, a big part of Asia, for example, and a lot of warmer climates in the world. Uh, you wouldn't really have any incentive to um, store foods, at least not for a longer period of time. And the interesting thing with all of these marginal climates doesn't really matter where you are in the world. They have two product groups in common that have been, you know, like a huge Im historical importance, um, and essentially things that made people live through the harsh winters. And those two product groups, there are grains and dairy. And both grains and dairy, they are not only high in energy, but they're also very easily produced in large quantities during fairly cool summers. And on top of that, both grains and dairy, they are easily prepared for storage. I mean, with dairy, you can think like cultured dairy products, butter, cheese, all things that keep really well, and all things that are very dense in energy, so they don't, they don't take up a lot of storage space when you keep them. Uh, for the cereals, I mean, all seeds of perennial grasses make great storage crop. They dry well. Um, they store well, and they can be turned into a lot of different things. And it doesn't matter, I mean, if you're uh, in the Peruvian Andes, if you're in a monastery in Bhutan, in the Himalayas, or if you're like in a suburb of Östersund where I grew up, um, it doesn't matter if it's uh, corn or red rice or wheat, or if it's milk from uh, uh, llama or yak or cow. The same sort of basic principles apply over all of these marginal climates. And I think that baking, which I thought was going to be very easy to define with baking, it turns out that it's not easy to define at all. And I think that baking is simply like a catch-all phrase for all of the ways that humankind can uh, turn grains, sometimes in the combination with dairy, into uh, food. How we can, can turn uh, these two basic product groups into something that's more easily digestible, more tasty, and more varied than you know, the products are on their own. And I think that the fact that we've created so much variation with such a limited number of base products as we have in baking compared to savory food. I mean, just imagine how, how almost all baking recipes, they contain like the f same five things in different variations. And if you look at the savory cooking, you have thousands of different base products that you know, becomes various combinations. And I think that this great diversity in number of recipes and expressions in baking, it really uh, uh, says a lot about how important and how big a part of our daily caloric intake that used to come from grains and dairy. You know, we were really, really motivated to create a lot of diversity in recipes. So today, uh, we often tell ourselves that we decide what we eat all the time that no one else dictates what products we buy and what we make from them. And from my perspective, this is obviously completely wrong. Because, I mean, we are animals. Uh, we do exactly what our species has always done. We, we procure whatever products that make sense to us there and then. And we uh, prepare them in whatever way that makes sense to us there and then. And then we eat them ourselves or with our flock. I mean, that's what we do. And the thing, though, that fascinates me so much with this, especially when it comes to baking. It's the amount of cultural knowledge that's transmitted between generations. Because eating correctly grown, preserved, stored, and subsequently prepared foods made from grains and dairy, it used to be incredibly important for our ancestors. Uh, for them, it was uh, simply about survival, which is, I mean, the single strongest motivating force of the human being. Today, for almost all of us, eating breads and cakes and buns and cookies or whatever else we've baked, it's mostly about pleasure, right? Um, and why do we find it so pleasurable? And the easy explanation here is that these items are dense in energy and that we are predisposed to like things that are dense in energy. And that might explain why we find a piece of 
cookie very tasty, but it doesn't explain why we're so motivated to pass on this cultural information between generations and why it's so pleasurable to bake. And I think that's simply uh, our, you know, uh, humankind sort of um, function put in, pli in place by humankind in our subconscious minds to make sure that we don't lose this information just because there's a new generation coming. Um, I mean, almost everyone I know take more pleasure and they feel more satisfied when they've baked something than when they've cooked something savory. I mean, personally, I'm more happy by, you know, when I bake a sponge cake than when, than when, than when I make an, an oven omelette. And, and I think this is just like a really good uh, indicator you know, on uh, how our minds function. And this sort of boils down to my final big reason uh, to why the Nordic baking culture truly is the greatest around there. Uh, preparing all of these grains and dairy products, well, it used to be more important where I come from than in almost any other part of the world. And I think this is also the reason why most people in the Nordics still bake more in their homes than people do in other parts of the world. We just take more pleasure in it because it used to be more important for us in the past. And as with all culture, I mean, if culture is regularly practiced, you know, on an everyday basis, if culture is allowed to um, uh, change gradually because of use, it will always be more diverse and deeply rooted than if it's carried out by just a few people or you know, uh, kept intact in a bubble. And I think this is like the final reason from my side to why uh, the Nordic baking culture is just the most diverse baking culture on the planet today. Thank you. And now we can do questions. <laughs> so uh, do we have a mic or, yeah. Cool. And it can be questions about this, uh, about the pro project with these books. It can be questions about Favik and my restaurant. It can be questions about anything you want, really. So raise your hands. You mentioned that sort of during the process for researching um, this entire project that uh, you thought at the beginning you knew a lot about sort of Nordic food culture and Nordic baking culture, but you found that you knew a lot less than you did. <laughs> um, what are some examples of some particularly interesting things that you learned? I mean, I, for me, the, uh, the most interesting I learned was actually how much diversity there's out there. Um, because I, I mean, first of all, there's no such thing as a common Nordic identity. Uh, I don't know if, I mean, there are some Nordic people here for sure. I mean, there might be more, but I think all, all of us living in the Nordic region, we, uh, we feel a strong identity, you know, connected to where we're from, but that's usually not like, hey, I'm Nordic, you know, <laughs> I'm Swedish. Um, and I think that because of this, we might not have been sort of receptive to uh, uh, the sort of our neighboring cultures as much as we should have. At least that's sort of applies to me. And just traveling around, you know, meeting people in their homes, uh, talking about food, seeing what they actually cook and bake on an everyday basis. Uh, it's just been eye opening how much, you know, difference in cultural diversity is out there. What's the difference in bread between hand kneading it and using a KitchenAid? Uh, I mean, the KitchenAid specifically, it's uh, one way of machine kneading, but, and you know, it has a specific expression because of the size of the bowl and the way it moves. But I think that if we just look at like machine processed versus hand processed, like theoretically, there has to be no difference. Like, it doesn't have to be any difference. Um, and uh, because the dough doesn't know what's going on to it, you know? And, and there is a lot of different machines that can take care of this. And this is something that I've spoken to a lot of bakers about. And uh, very begrudgingly, uh, most of them agree that a machine should be able to do it exactly as well as a human being. But then there are other parts of the uh, uh, baking process that machines, at least not yet, uh, are able to uh, replicate perfectly. In your research, did you find any regional difference between the different grains, depending on where they're grown? I'm thinking about all the different kinds of wheat. There are. What about different kinds of rye, for instance, different corn uh, coming from different parts of it? Is it all just so mixed in the processing? We don't really know. 
the, the thing is that, I mean, if you look further back, there was more regional diversity. When, when farmers would take and produce their own seed from their crop and then reseed that next year, you would have a larger degree of genetical diversity in whatever was produced uh, in various regions, not just grains. But today, I mean, for the last you know, 100 plus years, uh, pretty much all of the commercial growers of cereal crops use the same handful of uh, varieties. Um, and in this book, it's about this documentary uh, object about what people bake today at home, meaning that most of the research has also been into what people use at home, which is largely the same types of flour. I just thought it would be interesting to have terroir of different. It will be very interesting to have terroir of different grains, but it's actually non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are, we, we buy, for example, to Favikin, we buy uh, specific varieties of various grains from specific farms, and we use that. But I mean, that's a very extreme expression of uh, baking. That's not uh, at all representative of what people bake in the home. And I think that we will most likely never have that type of variety in the home, just for practical reasons. I mean. Uh, and then whether that's sad or whether it's efficient and good, I mean, that's up to anyone. And, and for me, uh, I mean, I, a big part of making this book has also be to, been to sort of remove my opinions from the content matter, which is not easy all the time. Uh, because when you run a restaurant like Fabric, and it's all about pushing your agenda and your opinion and showcasing that in the food. But for it to be documentary and representative for the region, I had to sort of remove that. What do you consider a therapeutic dish to make? Hmm, therapeutic dish to make. I mean, I think that uh, pretty much all baking can be fairly therapeutic. I like making chocolate oatmeal balls, uh, which is essentially butter and sugar and oatmeal and cocoa powder. And very rarely does it ever make it to the ball stage. I mean, usually it sort of just disappears meanwhile. <laughs> My, you mentioned earlier talking about the fresh yeast. Mm -hmm. uh, I've definitely found it very frustrating following Nordic recipes because the expectations of like a convection oven and fresh yeast and cork. Uh, you mentioned that you did some uh, testing in mm -hmm. America. What changes did you find that you had to make or what, how did you acknowledge these differences in your books? Yeah, so it's actually it's a bit complicated because, as I said, it's, an, it's a documentary book, so none of the recipes have been adapted in any way, uh, I, not you know to sort of better fit specific territories, or even if I mean I've seen a lot of recipes where I'm like I can do that so much better <laughs> uh, if I change it a little bit, but I haven't done that. And the same thing goes here. So what I've done though is that I've written narrative text and I've sort of provided information on some of these topics, like I've written how yeast functions, for example, and what the differences would be between fresh and dry yeast. And I've explained a little bit on how to substitute and how to work with that. I've written about the variation in different flowers, because there's a huge difference in flowers across the world, not just between America and other parts, but everywhere. And even within the US, there's a big difference in how flower behaves. And then there is also other recipes, you know, on what to do if you don't have a giant wood-fired brick oven, for example, when you make flatbreads and stuff like that. Um, but it is documentary, and the recipes as such, they are exactly as they are in the Nordic region. Uh, I'm really curious to hear more about the interaction of identity and nationality. Um, it, do you think it's the case that um, there's not a sort of, there hasn't been a, this, this identity of uh, a food culture because there's so much regional diversity? And then also on the other side, you, you know, your, your books are branding this idea of Nordic cuisine, or are you, do you think there is a broader Nordic identity that you beyond the national identity that is emerging or that you would like to see? I think that it's always been there. It's just that, you know, us living there, we don't like to acknowledge it <laughs> because we feel more strongly for our specific national identity rather than like a common Nordic one. And the common, or, and the Nordic region, I mean, it's a geographical region, it's not a cultural region. Um, but it, there are a lot of things that sort of bind us together culturally as well. Um, but there are equally many things that sort of tell us apart. And one interesting thing that you can see when it comes to the, you know, what people used to cook and still cooks today, and bake as well for that matter, is that at, at the sort of base you have these uh, climatic and geographical differences. That's a constant, that's just there. And then on top, on top of that, you'll have a geographic or a, a cultural layer as well, like a little cultural filter that informs uh, you know, what people do with these geographical circumstances. And most of that, 
I would say. It actually depends on whom occupied whom in the past, um, which is sort of strange and a bit interesting and funny. But you can divide um, the Nordic region into two cultural regions. One that's Swedish influenced, and that's like from Sweden and then Finland and around the Baltics, all the Baltic countries and Poland. They're not part of the Nordics anymore, but they have a very distinctive sort of Swedish uh, influence on that cultural layer on top of the geography. And then the Western bit would have the same with Danish influence. And it really shows, because in that cultural region, for example, you have Greenland, the Faroe Islands, and Iceland. I mean, Greenland and Faroe Islands are still part of Denmark. Iceland was occupied by Denmark for many, many years. Uh, none of these islands um, would have ever seen any grain before the Danes came. Because the climate you know, doesn't really support growing <laughs> grains, uh, and they're just so isolated. But today they have a, a bread culture, and you can trace almost all of it back to the Danish cultural influence. So all of these countries, they will have their own version of, for example, like the very iconic uh, Danish rye bread, but made to suit their circumstances. On Iceland, for example, the country that has almost no trees, the uh, source of energy to heat the home was traditionally uh, peat moss that was dug out of a, a peat bog and lugged home and dried and then burnt. And obviously a very laborious process to create fuel, meaning that people weren't exactly inclined to fire up a giant brick oven to bake a loaf of bread. So, I mean, before the Danes came there, they didn't really have any, any type of baked goods at all. Uh, with the Danes came people from Denmark who obviously lived uh, on Iceland uh, because it was occupied, you know, managing everything. They wanted their bread. Uh, and Iceland has a lot of volcanic activity. So what people did instead was to just dig holes in the ground outside of the villages and lower a bucket of rye bread down into the hole, come back the day after in the morning and pick up a loaf of steamed bread. And that still goes on today. And it's very easy to think, you know, when you're on Iceland, that, oh, they've been doing this for like a thousand years, but they haven't, you know. They've been doing it for like 200 years, which is not very long in a historic or historical perspective. You're going to question also about what is your favorite recipe in this book? <laughs> I mean, as I said before, it's been, most of the process has been about me not imposing too much of my opinion on the content matter. Um, and the choice of recipes, it's entirely uh, independent on what I think is good and bad. It's about what represents the most people in the region and the most parts of the regions as well as possible. But then naturally, I mean, there are recipes that for various reasons uh, I personally feel more for. And there will probably be things that has to do with my childhood, like uh, soft Swedish flatbreads, for example. I mean, the chocolate balls I mentioned earlier. Um, and then things I didn't know existed, like the Icelandic rye bread is also, to me, very appealing. If, even if I've never baked it myself, I mean, it's the, the fact that it uh, sort of exists. I have a question about flowers, and if you just have a recommendation for a resource for the non-professional or the non-culinary school educated person, I love baking, and I'm, historically I've always been interested in alternative flowers, and now I'm really interested more in wheat flowers, but just the variation of wheat flowers and understanding the protein content and how they all interact and what brands to buy, simple things like that. I find myself going to a million different places all over the internet and Googling, Googling things. <laughs> um, and I don't know what's right, and I, I'm just wondering if there's a central resource that you would tell someone to go to, oh, this is a good education on flour. Um, <clears throat> I don't have one specific one that's available here, uh, and what I do know is that there is like a huge amount of difference, uh, not just in what grains that you know, are used to make flour, but also in the various processes used, like how things are milled, uh, how things are aged, how they are transported, and so on. And it all affects how they bake in the end. So I think that the only thing that I can suggest is, I mean, try buying a flour that seems to be good. Because there are many other reasons than just the pure functionality. It might be that it's organic, that it's milled close to where you live, whatever. Buy that and then um, use only that until you learn how it behaves. And then you'll be able to adapt recipes into that. You know. Um, and it, it, it's very hard to be general about these things because they, they, they differ so much. And there are no, I mean, there, I haven't found any great books on this. There's lots of research papers. I mean, you can go into like university search engines and you can look for things and read people's crappy abstracts about, you know, wheat kernels and things like that. Uh, and it is very interesting. 
Um, but uh, maybe someone should write that book. Hi, um, you just defined uh, earlier baking as the transformation of grains. And um, my family is of Norwegian origin, and but we've been here for a while. And we make <coughs> lepsa, mm -hmm. which is from potato. So it's that. But never yes potato, right? What? Never yes potato. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> is that fit in your definition? It does. And can you tell me anything? I don't know anything about it. So lefse is uh, the traditional uh, Norwegian flatbread. And the big difference between lefse and most of the other flatbreads in the Nordic region is that they are griddled. They're not baked in an oven. And uh, they also use other, it's not just flour based, as you say, quite a few of them have potato in them. Uh, a lot of them have peas in them as well and things like that. And the reason why they're not oven baked is that most of Norway, uh, it's a bit like Iceland in the sense that there are not any like large deep forests uh, in most of the country. And in, that's compared to Sweden, for example, where like the generation of my grand grandparents, I mean, they all had a thousand hectares of pine forest, you know, <laughs> that was pretty much worthless. All that was good for was firewood. So they had a lot of that. And therefore we have a tradition of these great big brick ovens. On every farm, there is one of those. So all of our flatbreads are baked in that. Norway, they didn't have access to fuel in that way. So they had to be more um, energy efficient. And like a little fire under a griddle, you know, it's a, it's a much more efficient way of baking flatbreads. So, so I think, yeah. In your research, uh, you try to kind of, like you said, not alter any of these recipes. Are there any recipes or like breads made in very far off regions that you are worried about will kind of die out or anything that you want to do to preserve them? So this is also something that I realized during this process. And before this, I think that I uh, was more on the sort of opinion that uh, traditional food culture is very important to preserve as it is. And I've come to realize more and more that it's actually that's completely wrong because food culture has to be allowed to evolve and we will always um, eat what makes sense to us wherever we are, uh, whoever we are, and whatever time it will be. Um, what's important, though, is to preserve the uh, knowledge, to make sure that food culture is properly and accurately documented, because it's a waste of knowledge if it just sort of you know, stops being practiced and then everyone just forgets about it. It might have taken uh, generations or thousands of years uh, of sort of empirical uh, study and living to come up with a lot of these techniques. But, uh, and, and this is a, it's a hard thing actually, because uh, almost everyone has, doesn't, you know, don't quite agree with me on this. Almost everyone, I think often without thinking, just sort of uh, says that these traditions are so important to keep alive, but like who's gonna keep them alive? I mean, in Sweden we have sour herring, for example, the stinkiest food on planet Earth. Um, and I think that, I mean, wait 30 more years and it's gonna be gone. And I'm not going to be sorry that it is gone. <laughs> but I would be very sorry if the knowledge on how to make it would disappear just yes, because we don't eat it anymore. You know. I'm also from uh, Sweden. And, uh, Hello. <laughs> uh, it seems to me like what you said about baking applies to a lot of other foods as well. So my experience is a lot of us eat home-cooked food um, every day. And I haven't seen that to the same extent in other places that I've been in, so in here, but mm. places in the world as well. So first of all, do you think that's true? And what is the biggest reason in that case? I think, yeah, I think it's absolutely true. Uh, even today, I mean, the, the, the development in the Nordic region, especially in the bigger cities, is that people eat more and more out. It becomes more and more like other parts of the world. Um, but we still eat uh, a bigger part of our meals in the home uh, cooked by ourselves than almost any other Western culture does. And I think it has to do with, the, historically, a, a lot of different reasons. One of them being scarcity of population that just not um, uh, enough people in a large part of the region to sustain restaurants. And then I think that there are cultural factors on top of that as well as religion, for example, and many other things. Um, but what I do know though is that this is one of the reasons why Nordic food culture and baking culture is so little understood because it's inaccessible, not just the way I spoke about before with like sort of uh, recorded information, but also like the practical act of eating Nordic food. I mean, if you go to Sweden, for example, as a tourist, and you go to Stockholm and you think to yourself that I'm gonna have, you know, one traditional Swedish meal when I'm here, 
you're not going to get that. There is not a single restaurant in Stockholm that produces an, uh, uh, something that's remotely uh, close to like an authentic version of what people eat in their homes. Because that's not what restaurants are about in that region. And that differs a lot from um, uh, Central and Southern Europe, for example. I mean, it's very easy to go to Spain and go to a restaurant and find something that's definitely a bit adapted to the world of restaurants, but that fairly accurately represents the same thing as you would cook at home. You know? Thank you. We had a question also. Is there any tradition of high altitude baking in the Nordic region? Uh, we don't have that much high altitude <laughs> in the Nordic region. And, and where we have a bit of altitude, uh, I mean, in Sweden, I mean, the, like the, the tallest mountains are like 1,500 or so meters. Uh, and no one lives there. I mean, traditionally, yes, no one lived up there. It's like where, where I'm from, uh, which is considered quite high in altitude, is 350 meters. So, uh, so I, I don't have a specific, uh, any specific knowledge of it. I know that we had some feedback from like, recipe testers in Mexico City, for example, uh, that a lot of the recipes behave very differently. Thank you guys for coming today, and thanks for having me again. Today.